Our first keynote speaker today is Tom Kittle. Tom is the director of Nile, and he is the vice chair of the Equals Board of Trustees. He has worked in ELT on four continents in teaching, teacher training, and assessment. And in fact, Sonia <laughs> calls him the key, <laughs> the king of assessment. <laughs> um, today, he's going to be talking to us about something different, though. He's going to be talking to us about key competences for language teachers in the 2020s, which he tells me have changed over the past six months. So, Tom, welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Um, pleasure to be with you all. Let me just get uh, things started here, um, if I may, with a share screen. So hopefully you can see the, the title there. As, uh, as um, Sarah said, I'm um, Tom Kiddle. I'm director of Norwich Institute for Language Education. And I want to be talking today about key language teacher competences in the, in the 2020s. And I'd like to, to start by saying that this is a, a personal take on what I see as the, um, the challenges and the competences in terms of professional knowledge, professional skills that language teachers will need to take with them into this third decade of the 21st century. And obviously all of this is underpinned by the, the changes that we've all experienced as a, as a professional community and also as a global community in the last six months. So it's influenced by that, but I'm not gonna spend time talking about um, pandemic or, or uh, emergency responses to it. Uh, I'm gonna talk more broadly about what I think is coming down the road in terms of what we need to be prepared for as language education professionals uh, in the coming uh, in the coming decade. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, at the International House Milan conference. Uh, a pleasure to be invited and um, to return to Milan uh, virtually from my office in Norwich, if not um, physically, which is one of the sad things about. Uh, the, the conference presence here today that I was uh, originally invited to be a speaker for your face to face conference and I have a very strong um, love of my time in, uh, in Milan when I was studying uh, over in Venezia in my undergraduate degree uh, on Renaissance history and visited two of the, uh, the best um, places in Milan, in my opinion, uh, Il Duomo and the San Siro, um, which tells you a little bit about my, my priorities and preferences. Um, but it's a pleasure to be to be with you all today virtually, and I hope uh, that the rest of the conference goes uh, as well as, as I uh, understand last Friday did, and that there's something in here for you uh, at whatever stage of your teaching career you are. Uh, and let's start with that, that idea of um, where you are in your teaching career. Um, particularly, let's think about you know, the development that you've undergone in your career. Perhaps you can focus this on uh, the last six months and where your your own personal professional development has taken you and how you feel about that professional development. Just take a moment to have a look at the, the characters represented in this image. Where do you feel you are in your own professional development? Do you feel you're, you're just starting out and at the beginning of this bridge on the left with a little bit of um, nervousness, trepidation, perhaps like this guy, um, curious at the start of the journey? Do you feel you're, you're somewhere in the middle? Um, and you're not quite sure which way to turn or you're balancing a tightrope? Do you feel you've kind of reached the end of, of uh, a professional development experience or, or journey that you've had and with success or you've done that with colleagues? Do you feel that everything's a little bit overwhelming at the minute and you're just hanging on by your fingertips? Or do you feel that something has been holding you back and restricting you that you haven't been able to, to, um, to fully get the development that you want or that the development you were hoping to, to take has been curtailed or, or postponed by what's happened in the last six months. Um, I think all of us have, have experienced this, this sudden realization that professional development is, is an ongoing part of our, our uh, careers and that anybody who was perfectly prepared for everything that uh, was going to happen back from February had a crystal ball that uh, would be rather valuable in, in other senses of just the, their profession. Um, but we had a kind of an emergency response phase at the start when we were all back at this start of the bridge and then 
over those first couple of weeks and months, we were kind of doing, doing what we could to get our teaching online, to learn these new platforms, to learn these new skills. And then I think we entered into a slightly different phase, which was a phase of creativity and innovation. And we were trying to, to experiment with things that we could do differently and things that maybe we could do better with the, uh, the online learning experience and bringing in asynchronous content and, and getting students engaged in different ways and, and learning the, the the intricacies and the, the affordances of these platforms. And I think that creativity and innovation really struck a chord with, with teachers and, and such fantastic um, innovative responses and great ideas coming out from teachers around the world and sharing of those ideas in, in forums just like this, where people were talking about what they were doing, what they experimented with, what worked well, what didn't work well. And now I think we're, we're moving into this, this phase of, of consolidation and a sense of future proofing. We know that things, uh, there isn't a clear light at the end of the tunnel. We're going back to online teaching and learning in some situations. We're seeing new moves towards kind of hybrid co-modality classrooms, where there's um, people physically present in the room and people present virtually at the same time in the same learning event and, and and we're talking about what kind of things we're gonna we're gonna keep as we do return to face-to-face -face classrooms which we will and which will, will come what are we going to keep from this experience of online uh experimentation that we want to hold with us when when things return to a, a classroom whether that's a socially distanced classroom or hopefully a vaccine empowered classroom where we can return to the the kind of teaching we, we know and love and we know that works with our students but within all this all this experimentation and, and innovation there's this underlying element of of online and digital and the fear of, of what this might mean for our role as a teacher. So this whole conference is about empowerment and I'm really keen to, to emphasize the empowerment of teachers being central to the development of, of teacher competencies and, and learning uh, practices in this decade. And I'm not um, a glass half empty person. I'm gonna be very positive about what I think the future for teaching and learning and teachers is. Uh, and I'm not one of these people who is gonna say, oh, the best thing you can do is learn another profession. I think we're gonna be central to the teaching and learning experience for many years to come. And I'll explore that and give my personal reasons for that uh, in, in different sections of this uh, presentation today. But I think we can't deny that this fear exists. This fear exists for us as teachers about what's happening and what's potentially going to happen to our profession. But we're not the first people to think like this. I want to take you back over a hundred years. And I'll take you back to the year 1910. And in the year 1910, a French artist called Villemard did a series of paintings. And he was predicting from his standpoint in 1910, what the world would look like in the year 2020, the start, sorry, in the year 2000, the start of the 21st century. He did a series of paintings about all aspects of life. He did a painting about what architecture would look like, what transport would look like, what home life would look like. And fascinatingly, he did a picture about what he thought, from his position in 1910, education would look like in the year 2000. What do you think he would have predicted for education at the start of the 21st century? Well, here was his vision of the future from his position in the past. You can see it's kind of a dystopian, nightmarish view of education. Students wired in, passive recipients of this content, the teacher reduced to mere content provider, feeding in the knowledge, not even engaging directly with the students. This poor child on the, on the right doesn't have access to the technology, unable to participate in the learn, learning process. And I think for, for some teachers, this fear is, is very palpable and we think, you know, is this the future of our profession? Are, are we going to be reduced to, to feeding content to our learners and, and asking them to, to interact with it, reducing the teacher's role to, to a, a transmission provider of content? Is this the fear that we have? Well, it's there, it's a challenge if we're solely reactive to the changes that happen around us. But I feel that teachers are central to the proactive approach to taking back the power within the classroom and embracing the opportunities that digital and online offer to us, but replacing ourselves or installing ourselves in the center of that learning experience and challenging this dystopian view of, uh, of a future that comes from, from a past perception of, of what technology might do to us. 
So I want to talk to you about five different competencies that I think teachers need to um, centre themselves within the teaching and learning process as the world changes and continues to change. And the first one is about teachers' language awareness. And I'd like to start with this quote from Confucius more than 2000 years ago, talking about what we need to be aware of. And he's saying a common man marvels at un uncommon things, fireworks and, and the bells and whistles and the, the, the amazing things that catch our attention for a moment. But actually, the wisdom comes from looking at things that are common, are things that are under the surface and all around us and are changing subtly. And for me, that means that teachers have a responsibility to develop and continue to develop their own language awareness. And I mean awareness of what's happening in the language and how language works. There's a tendency, I think, in, in teacher training programs to think of language awareness being more like language analysis. Can you pass a sentence? Do you know where the verbs and the nouns and the prepositions are? And can you um, talk about breaking down a grammatical structure into its uh, first into its subject, verb, object, etc. But I think it's more important to be aware of other changes in the language. And one of those changes we might think of as a kind of um, a diachronic change, the way language changes over time. If we go back 700 years to the 14th century, English language looked very different from how it does today, this Middle English of Chaucer. If you look at this extract from the Wife of Bath's Tale, you can see, yes, there are there are some words which we recognize immediately that have stayed with us almost unchanged uh, over 700 years. There are some words that you can you can guess at their their current spelling and their their uh, meaning because there's just a slight change over time. But there are other words in there, other structures in there that are completely impenetrable to us from our standpoint in the 21st century. There are whole um, phrases that make it very difficult to understand. If we look at the, the translation there, we can see how much of those needs to change to literally translate from Middle English into into modern English. If we, move, if we move forward in time, a couple of hundred years, we start to see the 16th century, the, the age of, of European discovery and the old world meeting the new world and, and that influence on, on um, communication and communication channels leading to a, a more standardized view of English. So we take one from, from Shakespeare here and we can see that there are these things we'd call perhaps old fashioned English, these thou's and these these and the art and, and these contractions of the, um, the past tense and the adjective forms, but generally becoming more recognizable and um, more what we'd expect from modern English. And there's a, a feel that actually the progression then was to greater and greater to standardization so that where we are now there's a standard form of English we can open the dictionary and expect to find a standard spelling that's appropriate but actually that's not the case what we've seen in the 21st century and the late 20th century is another sense of change over time the influence of more varieties of English different world Englishes different influences of, of dialects and regional versions so if we take something from um, the late uh, 20th century a Scottish dialect being put into the, the literature of the, the English language and, and understanding how different varieties of language influence the language we use and the language we read and the language that's around us there. So as teachers, we need to be aware of this synchronic change and we need to, to, to sort of this diachronic change, this change over time and what's happening to, to the language we use, perhaps more from a, a receptive awareness perspective amongst our learners and, and bringing uh, different Englishes to our learners' perception so they're not totally horrified when they see differences between real world Englishes and the English of the classroom. Um, but also we need to be aware of, of the uh, what's called the synchronic changes, the influences of um, a change on our, on our language that's around us today, the influences of technology, the influences of culture, the influences of global events, the, the new words we never thought we'd be talking about six months ago, words like furloughs and curfews and um, pandemics, and then these new blend words which have been created to talk about instances and, and individuals within this. You may have heard the term COVIDiots, people who flout the rules and have no respect for others in this pandemic. These, these new words entering our language all the time and, and being receptive to those as teachers and, and bringing them in and embracing them is part of our empowerment to, to own the language and own the way that students can, can uh, integrate that language as part of their receptive awareness and if they want their, uh, their productive competences as well.
So there's this side of language awareness, which is all about language change. But then there's another side of language awareness, which is equally important, which is about language choice and being aware that language is a choice. And that as language users, we make those choices and the choices we make reflect our aims and intentions and viewpoints of the world and viewpoints of our listeners and our audiences. Have a look at these two sentences. The first one, you'll probably easily be able to say, okay, this is reported speech. This is what we see in the, the course books and the teacher's methodology books about how we go one tense backward when we're reporting and how we put um, deixes in there of things that we're talking about outside the, the immediate frame of reference when we're reporting it. And that's fine. But that sentence at the bottom is doing exactly the same thing. It's reporting language that we've heard it's reporting it in a very natural way. It's using colloquial expressions to do that. It's using different verb forms. It's using the, uh, the, the structure to be like and to go as the reporting verbs. It's not reported speech, but it's certainly reporting speech. And you can see the implication there. If you hear the first one versus the second one, or if you hear the second one versus the first one, the content is the same in terms of the cognitive processes we're understanding, but the implications of the speaker tell us so much more about how they see relationships between you and me, between me and the events I was in, between the social structure we see ourselves as sharing. And these choices that the speaker make are very valuable. And these are a part of our competencies as teachers to understand that this language choice is not a binary here's a situation so here's a rule it becomes a part of the individual's ability to establish their own identity another example taking a simple pair of conditional phrases well they're both talking about a similar future prediction but the first one gives you the implication that i think this is real that i think that this is something that's actually coming towards us and we need to be prepared for it and, and, and I've got my response ready and I, I'm reassuring you. The second one gives me a bit more distance and I'm telling you that yes it's still a possibility but it's a more distant possibility and let's not think about this as our, our first, uh, our plan A response, let's deal with it when it comes, cross that bridge when we come to it, we say as an idiomatic, idiomatic expression. And this choice of language by the speaker tells the listener exactly how you, they want you to perceive this situation. And that's really important. I made this terrible mistake myself, if you'll allow me a, a personal digression. When, um, when I was, uh, uh, what would this be, about 12 years ago, um, my partner was, was, uh, had just found out she, she thought she might be pregnant with our, our first child. And I said to her, foolishly, I said, well, if you were pregnant, this is what we'd do. And she looked at me horrified because I used a second conditional. I distanced myself from this event. I'd made it her problem and made it a, a, a hypothetical possibility. If only I'd thought to say, if you are pregnant, this is what we can do, then it would have given her that reassurance. And so this language choice is important. It's telling our audience how we view things. And it's important because it constructs our identity. You may have seen articles like this in the, in the national and international press that AI is coming to take over language and, and robots can generate language and, and robots can process language and AI can translate language. But that's not what language use is about. Language use is about determining our identity through language, about making choices based on our idiolect, the way our own individual language is expressed, and our socioelect, the way we interact in our, our social um, settings that we are comfortable and confident in, that gives us our identity. AI can only make us all sound the same. It can't give us that ide individual identity, which is where teacher empowerment comes in, because we can give our learners that individual identity to create their own identities in the target language, whether that's a second language, a foreign language, a third language, but being able to have an identity in that language is what's crucial about being a competent language user, and therefore awareness of that is crucial in language teacher competence. We need to understand that language choice is about more than just a correct form or function. It's about making a choice which tells your audience, tells your listener how you see the distance 
from yourself and the event, how you see your distance between yourself and either your audience or the other people in that event, about how you want to express the aims and the intentions of the pragmatics of why you're speaking, how much shared knowledge you expect or you assume between you and your audience, how much emotion you want to put into it. You, um, you may know the, the, uh, the humorous um, expression of how much difference there is between saying, I'm in the bath and I'm in the bath. Same language, same function, same structure. AI is only going to be able to give you a translation of that. It's not going to be able to embed it with all of the, the influence and the, the subtleties and the nuances that, that that speaker has. And that's a very classic example from, from the literature of English language teaching, but it serves this idea of how do I invest my identity in the language choices that I make. So teacher language awareness is a key competence. We need to keep developing that. We need to keep the awareness of language change and we need to have central to our view of language, language as choice. Grammar is choice, vocabulary is choice and that choice creates our identity as language users. <clears throat> the second area I want to move on to think about is assessment. I'm blushing with, with Sonia's uh, com comment there, but I, I do have a, a professional and personal long interest in, in assessment, and it's a, a lot of what my, my uh, academic work has been in. So let's start with a test, and here's the test. It's a multiple choice test. You'll be very familiar with this kind of test. Uh, it's a four item multiple choice test, and the question is, which tree is the biggest? And you can type a letter in the chat box if you like. Which tree is the biggest? Is it A? Is it B? Is it C or is it D? Well, the answer, of course, is it depends. It's a rubbish question. And a lot of assessment can be reduced to that very simple concept. It depends on the answer if we haven't formulated the question well enough. A lot of the fault in testing is that the question's not formulated to, to give us the answers we're looking for, to enable us to see the results that actually matter to us, to enable us, enable us to measure meaningfully rather than just numerically or, or tangentially. Let's take this analogy a little bit further. If we're looking at language rather than trees, we could say that tree A, maybe it's got the most leaves on it. It covers the biggest area in space. It's got the most vocabulary that a learner can demonstrate. Maybe if we're interested in the, the breadth of vocabulary a learner has, then, then our answer is A. A gives us the biggest picture of that. Or maybe the answer is B because we're actually measuring on a scale and we're looking for someone who's reached the highest point on a scale of proficiency. And we're using a range of measures to determine which is the highest. And that's our definition of biggest. It may be that actually C is more representative because it's the girth, the breadth of knowledge, the ability to use language in different domains across different um, registers and social settings that we're actually interested in. And so C is the biggest in that sense. Or it may be that our view of language in a particular test is we want to know what's under the ground, what's the, the language knowledge that underpins our, our ability to, to use and to uh, understand language. And so we may say D is the biggest because the roots go down there. And of course, it depends because we have to formulate the question properly. But language isn't as simple as counting the leaves on a tree or measuring the depths of the roots. Language is more like a, a swarm of bees. It's dynamic and moving and flows at different situations. It's contained in a particular space. At others, it's, it's broader. It goes um, in and out. Where on earth, in terms of assessment, do we measure a swarm of bees? Where do you cut that at a particular time uh, in, in uh, a testing or a, uh, a syllabus and say, this is how big the swarm of bees is? Where do we feel confident that language is being measured in a way that's representative of what we're looking at? Because we've got challenges as language teachers, because we're always assessing. And I don't like this idea that there's a distinction between language teachers on one side and language testers or language assessors on the other side. A good teacher is always assessing. You're making a decision about whether to move to the next activity, about whether to move to the next page in the course book, about whether the learners are ready for the test or they need more revision. You're constantly making decisions and those are assessment decisions the whole time you're in a learning environment. But we've got challenges because we know that just because we can count something doesn't make it meaningful. 
Otherwise, we'd just have multiple choice grammar tests and that would be the only thing that we'd bother um, counting because it's nice and easy to measure in that way. But not everything that can be counted counts as the, the bigger picture. And not everything that counts can be counted. We know how important attitude and motivation are to language learning. No one would deny that the motivational factors in a classroom are one of the things we want to build as teachers. But how do we measure motivation? Why would we ever bother saying you're a five and you're a three and you're a four in motivational terms? So not everything that counts in terms of language progression and, and uh, language uh, ability can be counted in such a, an easy way. And also we have to remember that as professionals, we're still trying to do something that's much harder than rocket science. We're describing very complex phenomena, what happens in the brain in different parts of the brain when we receive language, when we compare it to our first language, when we um, mix, uh, switch codes in our brain, when we store vocabulary, when we retrieve structures, very complex ideas. And we have to talk about this in a small number of words because we're designing or using measurement scales, marking criteria, rubrics in the American English, uh, and we're, or we're explaining this score to a, uh, a sponsor or to a parent or another institution. And we're doing all this on the basis of what's still evolving and emerging theory. We don't know exactly the relationship between our first language um, acquisition and our second language acquisition. We don't know exactly what happens when we process language um, receptively or when we retrieve it for productive use. So as teachers, we've got these big challenges. And particularly as teachers who assess, we've got these challenges of fairness. And you've probably seen this cartoon before. It's possibly the most overused cartoon in, in language assessment. Um, but I think it's misunderstood because people see this cartoon and they get the joke and they think that that's, this means that a language test is not good if people fail it. And this cartoon is not saying that everybody has to pass a test for it to be fair. This cartoon for me is saying that it's okay for people to fail a test or not have the skills to pass a test as long as the test is designed to measure something that's appropriate and if the test is penalizing for their personal characteristics their, their gender or their cultural background then of course it's unfair but if we're looking for someone who can successfully climb a tree then we'll expect that some people don't have the competences to do that and we can work with them to develop those competencies in a learning setting, but the assessment still has to be rigorous and valid for the purpose we're trying to measure. If we have a test for uh, air traffic controllers, I don't want everybody to be able to pass that. I want only the people who have the skills that I'm trying to measure to be able to pass. And that is fair. That is a fair test, one that measures only the competencies that we're claiming to measure within our test. Because we have these challenges coming, we have other challenges coming down the road in this decade, I fear. Um, we have challenges of, of large scale standardized assessment, which are going to be something that we have to deal with. And as teachers, I think that's anathema to how we view language and our role in the classroom. I love this little quote, I became a teacher so that I could help kids pass a standardized test said no teacher ever. This is not what we got into education for. This is not what our love of learning is all about. We have to empower ourselves to look under the surface of assessment to un understand how even within a standardized testing system that learning oriented assessment, looking at assessment tasks, bringing them into the learning, using students as self-evaluators and peer evaluators, understanding what a test is trying to measure, even if the, the, the top level seems like it's, it's uh, difficult for them. What are the actual processes that are involved to get that answer? What do students need to understand about assessment and how can we as teachers give meaningful and useful f feed forward to allow them to, um, to progress against a test? So testing preparation is not just practice of, of past papers. Sorry, too many P's there. Um, it's not just about practicing past papers, it's about analyzing what's beneath the surface and re-examining assessment tasks as learning tasks. And the final thing I need to say about assessment is we have to also situate language assessment within the real world. We know that coming increasingly important these 21st skills we often see reference to creativity is a key 21st century skill in the real world collaboration is a key skill being able to work in teams is a key skill being able to search for information from other sources and process it and use what's relevant and appropriate to us these are all uh, key 
skills in the real world, professional language use and academic language use, but put creativity, collaboration, team working and bringing resources from outside the test into a test situation, we call it cheating. This is a strange contrast that we have to challenge as teachers. So perhaps we have to take the opportunity with the affordances of, of portfolio assessment and more uh, technology mediated assessment that we can do things that not in every situation, but in some situations allow us to embrace these real world skills in our assessment practices as well. So we have to, to fight against this conundrum that's on the screen in front of us. So we've talked about the importance of teacher language awareness. We've talked about the importance of teachers understanding that their assessors and understanding what underpins good assessment and, and useful assessment and, and measurement of ways that we're confident in and taking back control of that. I also want to talk about the environment. Now, many of you, when you hear environment, will be thinking about the bigger picture and our global environment and our climate change and our uh, responsibility for resources, uh, which is absolutely true. And I wouldn't want to underestimate that. And there's some fantastic organizations in our sector of education doing great work on that uh, ELT footprint organizations, really asking institutions to look at how they're using resources and, and how they're dealing with the, um, the challenges that are facing us as a, a world. But I think environmental awareness for teacher competences has a different uh, implication. And it's inspired by the work of Professor Stephen Heppel. And he's a professor who's um, come up with the concept and brought it to fruition of what's called the Learnometer. And this is the original concept on the top left and the, the current version of the Learnometer on the bottom um, in the middle there. And the Learnometer is something that Stephen Heppel has developed because he's brought to our attention the importance of learning environments, the importance of being aware as teachers of what impacts our learners when they're in a particular physical setting. He's brought to our attention how important good lighting is in a learning environment. Look at this quote. Good lighting significantly influences reading, vocabulary and science test scores. That means if you're in a poorly lit room in an examination setting or in a learning setting, the light will have an impact on your learners scores. It will have an effect on their performance, on their learning importance on their learning performance. We have to be aware of these things. We have to make sure that these environmental factors are not affecting our learners in ways that we could control if we took control of them. The temperature and humidity are crucial. As soon as we go over critical temperatures, performance declines in a measurable way, in a linear way. We can see the hotter it gets, the harder it is to learn. We need to be aware of the impact of temperature on our learners. We need to be impact aware of the impact of ambient sound and, and the distractions of sound rhythms and volumes outside the classroom and inside the classroom on the ability to concentrate, on the ability to learn. We need to be aware of how CO2 levels or particularly oxygen levels within a classroom impact on learners ability to perform. Classrooms with their students packed in, I know we're talking not quite at the current situation, but over the, the last 20 years, certainly students in a classroom with air conditioning and the windows shut and the same air circulating, by the first break, the CO2 levels are so high that it's above workplace limits. It's, it's not a, a, a healthy environment to be in. Stephen Heffel goes too far as to say, if you want your child to do well in school, tell them to sit by a window and open it. That's how important oxygen and CO2 levels are in a learning environment. And so these things, of course, are um, critical in a physical learning environment, but they're, they're also critical in our new normality, I'm not happy with that phrase, in our current um, existence as learning environments being in front of screens. We, we know there's environmental literacy as well in terms of what learners need to do when they're working on screens at distance. You may have heard of the 20-20-20 rule, which is crucial that every 20 minutes you should take 20 seconds to look at something that's 20 feet or six meters away from you. So in good practice for the next 20 seconds, I want you to take your eyes away from the screen and focus on an area six meters or 20 feet away from you. Go. Ah. 
the difference that makes to the eye strain of people focusing on screens for a long time is, is, is measured and measurable and important. Hydration is really important when learners are working in an online setting. Keeping a glass of water and making sure that people um, uh, rehydrate, getting the oxygen into that room they're working in, stretching, addressing posture. My colleague has a, a lovely app on her computer that's from uh, somewhere called stretch.ly and every 20 minutes it pops up a, a reminder across any other programs that tells you to, to stand up or to change your posture or to change your face muscles or just to remind you how important posture is in, in, in our learning environment. So we need to be aware of the learning environment as teachers and how we can reduce the strain on learners within that. Fourth competence, digital. We've already touched on it in some concepts. Used to be easy when I started teaching back in 1997, just after I returned from um, uh, uh, my first trip to, to Italy. This was what I found in my language school. Good old cassette recorder, overhead projector. If you worked in a, a really posh school, you may have had access to one of these. Anyone know what one of these is? You may be thinking projector, but no, it's even more fancy than that. This is an electronic pencil sharpener, only for the very posh schools. I never had one. We get to the current day, and it's kind of overwhelming, isn't it? That all the kinds of devices and applications and platforms and uh, options that we have out there, if you're part of any kind of professional social media, you'll see almost daily 15 best apps for teaching writing, 27 uh, tools for teaching listening. 36 uh, platforms for involving your students in, uh, collaboratively. It's overwhelming in terms of the number of, of uh, digital affordances, digital opportunities there are out there, those that are designed for education purposes and those that are appropriated for education purposes by, by um, quick thinkers and creative people, and nothing wrong with that, but we have to find a way in as teachers. We can't be bombarded by these without a principled approach, and I think that one of the ways we need to do this is to take a principled approach to the way we process digital content, digital platforms, digital opportunities. And one way to take the principles is to say, well, what actually, what's the, the why of why I'm using a tool? Why is this going to be useful? Is it because I want to do something or I want learners to be able to do something with their language? And what is it that I want them to do? Relating it to Bloom's taxonomy, remembering that there are different types of skills and maybe different um, platforms or different activities or different uh, actions we can do to harness and embrace one or other of those skills is crucial. There's a whole pedagogy wheel, which again is quite overwhelming, 188 different apps analyzed and categorized according to the Bloom's taxonomy, what taxonomy, what they focus on allowing students to do. But of course you can't be a master of all of them and you shouldn't want to be. Take your focus down, think about a couple of activities, a couple of actions, a couple of whys that you want to use in your uh, classes, in your learning, and then focus in on a couple of apps that work for you and explore those. Don't be overwhelmed by the, the plethora out there. Take a principled approach to, to selection of these and put the why first. The what will come later. Make sure your principled approach to digital content is the why always leading the way. And of course, we're in a new world where sometimes we think, oh, why me? Why do I have to be involved in, in online learning? But it's a, it's a necessity we're responding to. We're trying to deal with these situations. We know that online learning is, is still in its infancy, although it's been going for 40 years in some context. As a global phenomenon, the genie's out of the bottle. We can't put it back in. We need to work on best practices, pedagogies, good ideas, good principles. And this means a responsibility for teachers, because previously, we might have had teacher trainers coming in and telling us about this is what you can do in your classroom, this is a good technique for this, this is how to develop. But suddenly those teacher trainers who have 20, 30 years of classroom experience have less experience of the online learning world than the teachers who are working day in, day out on this. And that's a challenge for teacher trainers, but it's also a responsibility for teachers to collaborate, to share ideas, to be bottom up teacher developers of their colleagues to, to take this as we're, we're all responsible for each other's professional development now we have to be more collaborative about this because we're not going to get the guidance from above that we may have relied on and may have been there for very good reasons based on a classroom situation that's changing into online 
And increasingly, we're seeing instances of this hybrid or hybrid flexible or co-modality teaching, which are massive challenges for teachers. I think the pedagogical implications for moving into a hybrid classroom where you've got learners remotely beaming in and learners physically in the classroom, the pedagogical challenges are even greater than a move to online learning in its simple sense, teaching live through Zoom or another platform. And so these things need collaborative support and we need research to come from the teachers who are doing it, not from academics and, and, and experts who say this is the best way to do it. We need to see the on the ground practice and to see this best practice emerging. So that's our responsibility as teachers. Okay, we're on to the fifth competence. We're thinking about language awareness. We're thinking about assessment literacy. We're thinking about awareness of the learning environment. We're thinking about our own digital literacy and the principles that we're going to take forward. The final thing I think we have to be aware of that's coming increasingly down the tracks for this decade of the 21st century is the integration <coughs> of language and content. My colleague at Nile, one of our, our CLIL experts, talks about uh, CLIL in this sense. If you want to teach language, if you want to teach language, teach something else which is a lovely way of encapsulating the idea that the boundaries between language and content are shifting. They're shifting in a institutional sense, they're shifting in a learner perception sense, and they're, they're shifting in a teacher methodology sense. We're doing more and more teaching language with content, teaching language through content. We're seeing more and more instances of project-based learning, where the, the content outcome is driving the language work. We're seeing an increasing role in national, international, institutional, um, government settings of, of content language integrated learning, CLIL, and English medium instruction. We have to see where we fit on this, um, on this uh, spectrum from traditional general English and English specific purposes on the left, where the teacher in the classroom or in the learning environment has all the responsibility for the language, but is not responsible for any of the content. And the other side of the client where English medium instruction, the teacher's solely responsible for the content knowledge and this content skills development, but no responsibility for making the language better. Of course, they support it, but they're not responsible for in increasing language proficiency. And somewhere or in many places in the middle sits that content and language integration learning. And I think we're all going to have to see how we fit and how we can move across from end to end of this spectrum and support teachers who are working in EMI settings support teachers who are working with content and to, to be multifaceted in our perceptions of our role as an English teacher, that it's going to be increasingly a responsibility for content and language integration in our proficiency. And this is evidenced in the way that the new companion volume for the Common European Framework has, has expressed the skill of mediation. We're starting to see mediation taking a real center stage in the way we look at language proficiency and that mediation being that interface between a person and um, a text or between a person and another person and as a, a language user being the, um, the, the conduit of communication and knowledge and information is really going to be crucial in the, the real world professional settings where English is, is used. We're going to need to be able to flexibly process text from one language or from one variety of language or from one register of language to another. And the fact that all of these scales have been, it's been written about in the new companion volume, the 2018 companion volume, show how much greater importance these kind of non-linguistic skills, these skills that go beyond language to more professional competences um, are going to be important for us to, to manage and to master and to share with our students. And let me say, teachers are by definition great mediators. We have all those skills of processing complex information for our learners, of simplifying things, of exemplifying, of highlighting. Teachers are great, but how do we make our learners similarly competent in these areas? So I've made my case for five key teacher competencies that I think are going to be important for teachers to embrace, enhance, develop in these areas in the coming decade, so to empower them in the classroom of the, set of the third decade of the 21st century, because teachers have a role. We're going to finish with a last little assessment activity. That's, what should we call this? This is a, uh, a banked um, gap fill. There's a three gap text and three words at the bottom. Can you put the correct word into the text in the right place? Oh, 
So hopefully you've got something like this. Apologies for the he. I know that uh, a large proportion, um, a majority of teachers uh, around the world are, uh, are women. But the reason why this is he is because it's quite an old quote. It's actually from the fundamental seminal educationist John Dewey over, 100, uh, over 120 years ago. And it's just as important now as it was then, this idea that teacher empowerment, being able to critique the principles, being able to, to respond to the challenges, to be an intelligent medium of action, are what language teachers need to be in this third decade of the 21st century. And this empowerment is absolutely crucial to your day-to-day -day in the uh, IH Milan conference and to your uh, professional uh, satisfaction and where, you, where you're going to take yourself and how you're going to feel centered in the, in the learning of your students in the years to come. You need to remember that change is only gonna happen if you're empowered to make it. Teachers are fundamental to this process of learning. And in my view, they're not going to change because it's part of the human condition that we like to learn from others. And I think teachers role will continue for, for many years to come uh, if we are empowered to, to take some control of it in areas where we can. You may remember this little bridge that we started with. I asked you to put yourself at some point in this journey. I think the wisest person on this bridge is this figure I've colored in red at the top there. What do you think this person is saying to the rest of his colleagues on the bridge at various stages on their professional development journey? The fast typers among you may want to, to respond. The, the uh, others may wish to, to just think about what he might be shouting to those. I think he's saying, hey guys, there's another bridge over there. And this is really what professional development is all about. We get to the end of one journey and another one begins. And professional development is part of our empowerment. And please take the time for yourselves to think about how you deserve to develop and, and what ways you want to develop your competence in the coming years, because that's what's going to make you a, a satisfied and a successful teacher, in my view. Small ways we can help at Nile. We do have a completely free membership area on our website. And in that membership area, you can find all sorts of things, glossaries, activity cards for your classes, activity cards if you're a trainer, webinars, a podcast series, a tool for working with the CEFR, a tool to analyze text for language, uh, useful language within it. All of these uh, opportunities for professional development on a small slice, but it's a big world out there and, and I, I look forward to, to hearing some questions from you or some comments on whether this has challenged you or inspired you or you want to, um, to comment on any aspect of it. Thank you very much for your time and for listening to me and I hope that um, uh, Sonia will jump in and moderate some questions for us. Very inspirational, a lot of people are saying here. Please feel free to ask your questions in the question and answer box. There is one. <laughs> Will we have a chance to get these PowerPoint <laughs> materials? <laughs> that, that's a question. Why not? Yeah, I, I, of course, you can, you can have the, the slides. Um, I, I'm going to send them to Cesar and her colleagues at IHLAN, and they can be responsible for distribution. Is mm -hmm. that okay? Sure. Lots of very um, enlightening and empowering. Thanks a lot. Lots of comments. Thank you. Any, any, any comments from anybody out there or, or questions or challenges? Anything you think should have deserved a place in my five teacher competences that I didn't cover? Oh, there's a question about the man of the first drawing. From the 19, 1910, the first drawing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to, to, who was he? Yeah. Uh, I'll just type it in the in the chat box there. Wilmard, a French artist. Yeah, it's great to to search for him and look at the other the other views of the twenty uh, first century from nineteen ten. There's some uh, equally entertaining and and interesting uh, depictions of other other aspects of life. Yeah. An interesting question about, from Kids Can about the SEND students and the inclusion in the digital area era. Yeah. How can they be included? Brilliant question. Not my area. Uh, it, it's, um, I, I kind of gave the disclaimer at the start that um, 
these are five personal competences, ones that are areas of my professional academic is interest. Um, I, I totally agree that uh, a key teacher competence um, that's emerging and will be central to, um, to teachers' lives and to learners' lives is understanding uh, learning differences and understanding um, educational needs that come from a range of areas. It's, it's an area for, for my own professional development. It's not one I have the competence in now to, to respond. Um, we have uh, colleagues here at Nile who, who run our learning differences and inclusion courses, um, and I don't feel competent enough to, to talk on those except to acknowledge their importance. So if, uh, some, if one of them was giving this talk, it would certainly be one of the key teacher competences, and I'd, uh, I'd celebrate that. Um, but it, it's, not, it's not an area that I know enough about to, uh, to give a, a pronouncement or a recommendation here. Okay. okay, and one last question, we'll take this. VAC learning is so important in learning. VAK learning. Okay, so v VAK learning is this um, perception of, can we, can we break learners, um, let's, let's use the, the terms that they're embedded in, so uh, visual, auditory, kinesthetic learning, these learning styles, um, to what extent can we um, uh, can we predict, can we adapt to learners who have a, a preference for one of these areas? Now, from my perspective, I think that this, this VAK model has been effectively challenged. Um, and I think that we need to remember that uh, learners are different at different times of the day, of the lesson, of their lives, and that they will have different preferences and different learning needs within different activities. And so what we can best do as, um, as teachers is to ensure variety and to ensure that there are different ways of processing similar information so that we're not all one transmission method. We're not doing everything on the board, but we're providing um, uh, oral support for that. We're using images to support um, the, the commentary we're giving. We're allowing opportunities for learners to express themselves in different ways rather than thinking, okay, I can, I can identify that learner as a visual learner. I think that's quite dangerous because that identification may be true today, but may be very different tomorrow with a different activity and a different focus. Okay. I think we are all out of time for now, Tom. Thank you so much. I'll pass it over now. Thank you, Sonia. I might be frozen. Hello? You're back, yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tom. That's going to take me weeks to unpack, to be honest with you. <laughs> I took two pages of notes, even though I can watch this again whenever I want. <laughs> well, so there's value you. in that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. That was just really, Pleasure. that was really inspirational. Um, all right, I am going now to pass this over to Hannah, who is from Nile. Um, and she's going to share her screen and answer any questions that you might have um, about um, training opportunities and everything that Niall has to offer. Before I do that, I do want to say one thing. Um, in my opening, I talked about how we would all be um, with video and audio off today, but our next speaker would actually like to see some of you um, and hear some of you. So if you would be interested in, this is David, he's going to be talking about storytelling. Could you put your hand up if you would be willing to be on screen for David's storytelling um, uh, plenary? I will now, great, Simona. I will now pass this over to Hannah. Um, Sarah, can you still upload the presentation, please? I sure can. Great, because um, <laughs> I'm not... I'm not at work and I have children running about. And yeah, no <laughs> so. worries. Here it is. Um, Hannah, I've got it on a rolling. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. And I'll be here to answer any questions. So if anyone wants to um, ask in the chat, then I can either chat back to you or I can just talk. There it is. Okay. I'm going to mute myself.
So as I'm sure you know now from Tom, uh, Nile Norwich Institute for Language Education, we're based in Norwich. Um, in the UK, we um, have had online courses since 2014, so we're actually quite early on that one, which I suppose you could say was lucky for us this year. <laughs> but we have been able to, um, uh, to improve our courses to, um, to fit in with, um, uh, with the global situation now, which we are very pleased about. Um, our main courses, which you can see a list coming up there. We have more courses than these. Sorry, I should probably let you read rather than actually talk. But um, our main courses start usually in September, January and April. But then we have other courses as well. So it's always worth having a look on our website to see what's, uh, what's about to start. Uh, we also did a Delta fully online and obviously Delta module two with a local tutor. Our MA is very popular now and that can be done online, blended or face to face, very flexible. We're hoping to do this again in the summer. <laughs> so everyone else, but yeah, please, please do get in touch. So that's my email. That went very fast. So I'll put that in the in the chat box. And um, Tom's email is Tom at Nile T H O M. Oh, good luck. Do you see Tom's talk? No, I just reached out. Pick up their bit their audio on. It really is. <laughs> well, the presentation doesn't disappear, so I'll just talk a bit more about this. <laughs> We've been going for 21 years, uh, no, 25 years, yeah, 25 years. And um, yeah, now you can read more about us again. So uh, one of the main things about our online courses, our regular online courses, is that um, they were developed by us, by our trainers. And we worked very hard to, uh, to recreate the classroom uh, experience. So as you can see, there's only 16 participants on each course. And we do our very best to be as di um, different as we can from, um, from, for instance, the MOOC, the massive online courses. So there is a lot of interaction between um, between your classmates, between you and the tutor. And um, yeah, you could hardly see it now on the, at the bottom that um, we also now have a, an opportunity to do the Trinity College London uh, certificate for practicing teacher, teachers. And we just had our first round of those going through and it was a massive success and it was really good fun for both tutors and participants. So do go on our website and have a look at that. I'm also going to just type in the web address, even though I know Tom gave you that earlier. And then remind you of what Tom talked about, the membership area on our website, where you can find um, a free, free resources for teachers and teacher trainers. Uh, anyone who's interested, actually. <laughs> so... If you go on our website, you see that straight away. <laughs> 